Hello, here's module 11, where now we're going to uh, go back to look, looking at nonlinear systems. So, um, in the previous two uh, modules, we looked at section 5.2, and we found um, very precisely uh, what the trajectories in the phase plane look like for these linear systems. And we saw that all we had to do was look at the determinant and trace um, of the matrix for our linear system. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to use that information uh, together with some important technical theorems uh, to see that um, what happens in a nonlinear system can be obtained by just looking at the behavior around the equilibrium points and by linearizing uh, the system around the equilibrium points we can then use the previous classification uh, to get information about the system we're looking at. Okay so the <clears throat> first important technical theorem is the hartmann groban theorem. It's <laughs> just from 1959 so uh, compared to the math you usually teach in a, uh, that you usually learnt in an undergraduate course, this is pretty recent. And that theorem says that the behaviour of a nonlinear system in a neighbourhood of a hyperbolic equilibrium point is qualitatively the same as the behaviour of its linearization near this equilibrium point. Okay, uh, so what do I mean by hyperbolic uh, equilibrium? It means that when you look at the eigenvalues, uh, there's no zero real part. So that means um, there's not a zero eigenvalue or a purely imaginary eigenvalue. So this basically excludes the special cases that we uh, learnt in the previous section. Um, so those that lie on the axes of that uh, trace determinant plane. Um, and hopefully you can see what kind of what the problem is. Uh, those are kind of things on a boundary. And if you do a, a small perturbation to the system, um, it might jump either side of that boundary uh, when you do the, uh, from going from the, to the nonlinear case. Uh, in the special case when you're on the parabola, when you have two equal real eigenvectors, um, you can still conclude whether it's stable or unstable, right? Because if it shifts, it's going from a spiral to not being a spiral. So you can still say, say whether it's uh, stable or unstable, uh, but you can't say whether it's going to be a spiral. So that means that basically we're interested in those five open regions on the trace determinant plane. We can figure out if it's a sink, a source, a saddle, a spiral sink, or a spiral source. Um, so this theorem first appeared in 1959 in a, in a Russian paper, and there it is, if you can read Russian. Um, I'm very proud because I can actually understand what that word in red is. It's homeomorphism. Uh, and so that's, uh, that tells us that uh, this theorem, the hartmann groban theorem, is a topological theorem. So it's a, it's a theorem from uh, one sort of uh, a plane with vectors in it, so like a flow plane, one flow plane to another flow plane, and uh, it's saying that there's a homeomorphism around the neighbourhood of that hyperbolic equilibrium point. Um, so if you remember, topology is kind of like rubber sheet geometry, so you've got a flow over here, so you can take that picture from the nonlinear, you can send it to the linear, but you have to stretch it a little bit because it's a, it's a homeomorphism. Anyway. Okay, so we have a few things I have to teach you. The first thing is how to find equilibrium points. And so the interesting new bit of terminology here is null Klein. Uh, so a null Klein for for some derivative is the is the curve in the phase plane for which that derivative is zero. Okay, so you have x 
null clients and y null clients. The x null client is where x prime is zero, the y null clients is where y prime is zero. So let's have a look at a system. Uh, this comes from biology. So all this stuff that we're that we're doing now, this is actually, you know, if you do a PhD in ODEs, this is the kind of stuff you'll be doing. Um, and in fact, people who are doing PhDs in physics, chemistry, biology, economics, uh, you'll find people doing this kind of math as part of their research. Okay, so this is the model for uh, two competing species in the same ecosystem. It's not that they're eating each other, uh, you know, it might be like antelope and a gnu or whatever, two different types of antelope. Um, so that uh, they, they compete for the same food source. So here is our, here's some equations for it. And so we look for the null client. So we, if we look for the X prime null, the X uh, null clients, we see we can factor out an X from that equation. So one null client is X equals zero. And what's left behind is one minus x minus y. So that's the other null client. And for the y null clients, again, we can factor out a y. So we've got y equals zero. And then uh, again, we've got a straight line. Um, I don't know where that e comes from. OK, so here's a phase plane. And I've put in, uh, what have I? put in uh, in black looks like the X null clients and red is the Y null clients. And so where the black intersects the red, that is an equilibrium point. And so we see there are four equilibrium points. Zero, 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 three quarters, one, zero, and a half, a half. Of course, where two black lines meet, that is not a equilibrium point because that's just where two X null clients meet y prime is not zero at those points. And so the first module question is, give me the biological significance of these four equilibria. Okay. Next question, how do we linearize? So let's say we've got a equilibrium point. Um, so the first thing we, we do is we make a change of variables. Uh, we do, we let u equal x minus x star b equal y minus y star. So what, what that does is it moves the equilibrium point from x star y star to zero, zero. You can then do the substitution. Uh, you can plug it in to the equations you've got, and then you ignore any high order terms like u squared, v squared, uv, etc. There's going to be no constant term because of the change of variable, right? You've changed the equilibrium to zero, zero and you now have a linear system like you do, did in section 5.2. To get the same answer, and, and the easy way to do it, is you can just use Taylor series. So f of x, y, right? So by the chain, you do the change of variables. So x equals u plus x star, and y equals v plus y star. And by Taylor's theorem, it's going to be f of x star, y star, plus the partial at x times u, plus the partial in y times v, plus higher order terms. Um, again, we ignore the higher order terms. f of x star y star is zero, so you're left with that f of xy is approximately df dx times u plus df dy times v. And you get a similar thing for g. So then our system then is goes from an xy system to a uv system. uv derivative equals j uv, where j is the Jacobian. It's the um, a matrix of uh, partial derivatives uh, evaluated at the equilibrium point. Okay, because remember x star, uh, x prime is the first derivative, so this is like df dx is really the uh, the second derivatives. That's why it's a Jacobian. So going back to our example, there's our system. So we go and we take the partial derivatives 
and we, we find our Jacobian. So for example, uh, df dx, so we get x minus x squared, so the derivative of that is one minus two x minus and the partial of x, y is y, etc. And you can fill in all the four terms like that. So once you have the Jacobian, you can just plug in the equilibrium values. So at the origin, uh, J is the diagonal matrix one and three quarters. Um, so the you figure out the trace, that's positive, the determinant is positive, the discriminant is positive, so it's a source. At uh, zero three quarters, um, there is your um, Jacobian. You can straight, see straight away that it's a saddle, right? Because uh, you can read the eigen values of the diagonal and the, the eigenvalues of one quarter and minus three quarter. They're of opposite sign. Uh, the other thing you can see for that is, you know, you can see that the determinant is negative. So it's a saddle. Uh, one zero, okay, is also a saddle. The eigenvalues of opposite signs. And at half a half, uh, you see this trace is minus one, the determinant is an eighth, and k is a half. So you look at your little table and you realize, aha, uh -huh, it's a sink. Okay, uh, the fact that the trace is negative and the determinant is positive means that both eigenvalues uh, are negative and the discriminant is positive. So that means it's this uh, no imaginary part. Okay, so now what I want you to do is without technology, just give a rough sketch of what you think the phase portrait would look like, just taking into account what's happening at those four equilibrium points and just send a photo of the rough sketch to me. I'm not looking for a work of art, I'm just looking for something that fits the data given. And then the question is, well, based on your analysis, based on our analysis here about what the equilibrium points are, what do you expect to see happening of in the equilibrium, i.e. what's happening out there in the ecosystem? Okay, so, he, so let's just change the parameters a little bit. Uh, and here's the same competing mod, module, uh, competing model, uh, except with different parameter values. Okay, and so we get different null clines. We still get x equals zero and y equals zero uh, null clines, but the straight lines are different. And we go ahead, all right, x is zero, zero, zero is in equilibrium. If we plug in x equals zero into that, that second um, y null cline, you get y equals 10. And so you find those four equilibrium points. Okay, you have to redo the Jacobian because we've changed the equations. And again, we plug in the values for, for x star, y star to our Jacobian. At zero, zero, uh, our Jacobian has eigenvalues two and four, so it's a source. At zero, 10, we see that the trace is negative and the determinant is positive and the discriminant is positive, so it's a sink now. Okay, the corresponding equilibrium point in the previous example was a saddle point, now it's a sink. At 10, zero, we do the same thing. We get negative eigenvalues, so again, it's a sink. And this time at uh, 10, three, 10, three, the, the, the equilibrium where we've got non-zero values, uh, you see we have a negative trace, a negative determinant, and a negative discriminant, so it's a saddle point. Different. Uh, so, it's a, so it's kind of model, so it's some bifurcation has happened, right? So the model, the, the behavior is completely changed. It's gone from two saddles and a sink to two sinks and a saddle. And so here is what that phase portrait looks like. Okay, so we see some solutions going towards 
0, 10, some going towards 10, 0, and they're all kind of avoiding that uh, uh, um, equilibrium at 10 thirds, 10 thirds. And the origin we see is a source. Everything's sort of coming out of there. Okay, um, so let's look at the second technical theorem of today. That's the stable manifold theorem. And this comes from 1977, even, even newer. And the stable manifold theorem states that at a hyperbolic equilibrium point, the dimensions of the stable set and the unstable set are preserved in the linearization. So what that means for is, right, at a saddle point, remember in a saddle point, uh, in a linear system, we have exactly two tra trajectories which go to the saddle point and all other tra trajectories go away from the saddle point, right? The two trajectories that go into the saddle point both lie on the um, line generated by the uh, eigenvector that corresponds to the negative eigenvalue, okay? It's going from one direction and the other one's going in from the other direction. And they make up, so they're two rays together making up a whole line. Okay, and so the stable manifold theorem then gives us that corresponding to those two trajectories that go in the linearization, there are two trajectories which go to the saddle point in the original model, the unlinearized version, and that all the other trajectories go away from the saddle point. So these trajectories that that go into the um, uh, saddle point, that's the so-called stable manifold. And this stable manifold acts like the separatrix of the linear system. Remember, in, when we looked at the uh, linear, si uh, linear system, uh, if we've got a saddle point, then there's one line, the line corresponding to the negative uh, eigenvalue that separates solutions. Um, when they go off to infinity, they go off to, into different sides, depending upon uh, where they are in, in relation to that separatrix. Um, and so uh, the only point now I'm gonna mention, eigenpair, actually computing eigenpairs is at this point here. If you go ahead to that, uh, matrix that we had in eight there, if you go ahead and compute the eigenpairs for that, right, you're gonna get an I, a negative uh, eigenpair and a positive eigenpair. Um, so you can go to your model now and you can actually figure out where those, that stable manifold is near the, the equilibrium point. The trouble is it's not going to stay a straight line, right? Because it's a nonlinear system. So as you go out, the, the higher order terms come into effect. But you can, you can figure, figure out where they are. Um, and then corresponding to the positive uh, eigenvalue, you get the unstable manifold. And so here uh, in the picture you see there, you see the stable manifold and the unstable manifold. So these are the trajectories. So there's two trajectories that come into the saddle point and two trajectories that come out. Okay. And it seems like um, everything to the left of the um, stable manifold is going towards one direction. It looks like it's going towards um, the point uh, zero, 010 and everything to the right of the stable manifold it looks like it's going to 10, zero. Um, we kind of need another theorem to actually prove that. And this is uh, the most famous of the three technical theorems I'm gonna give you today. It's the Poincaré Bendixson theorem from 1901. This is, people quote this one a lot. Um, and it says that it's actually more general for than just a two-dimensional autonomous system, but if you just apply it to a two-dimensional autonomous system, it says that every solution that remains bounded within that phase, phase plane, then they must either approach an equilibrium point or a closed orbit in the phase plane. 
Okay, uh, so in particular, uh, for those who know chaos theory, it means that in a two-dimensional autonomous system, you can't have a strange attractor. Uh, if, you, if you remember the credits from Big Bang Theory, uh, they show a picture of a of a of a, um, a strange attractor. Basically, if you've got a a, a solution which just sort of goes bounded but sort of goes all over the place you know, sometimes it goes towards a point and sometimes away uh, you can't have that in two dimensions right because in two dimensions once you have an orbit since orbits can't cross it gives no room for the other uh, other other solutions whereas if you put it in three dimensions you have something wandering all over the place coming towards and then going away etc and there's still room for other kinds of solutions Okay, so uh, for our example here, it's straightforward to prove that solution, once solutions enters that uh, square, which is zero to 10 by zero to 10, it can never leave. All you gotta do is look at the arrows on the, on the boundary of the square. Um, so uh, combining that with the, th the previous theorem, uh, so, Poincaré Bendrickson th says that hence any solution that's that ends up in that square must go towards a since there's no um, closed orbits in this in this problem there's only two equilibrium points all solutions must go towards one of those two sinks and so combining that with the previous theorem that actually proves that's actually proved that if you have any solution to the left of this left of the stable manifold, it goes to 0, 10, and any solution to the right goes to 10, 0. Okay, and that's today's lecture. Uh, and in uh, tomorrow, uh, next one, we're gonna look sort of at more, um, more examples of this.